heaven, my first request is to be able to sing like Daniel. Uh, <laughs> oh, I appreciate his song leading so much. I'm always encouraged by it. Good morning, church. Good to be together today. Uh, I want you to know something, and that something is that Satan most certainly did not want you to be here today. I want you to know that Satan has, is going to try to work on you and convince you that this is not where you're supposed to be today. And not only that, but Satan's going to convince you that here is not the place you want to be tonight. And Wednesday night, and the same for next week and the week after that, Satan is going to work at you, and he's going to try to convince you that church is not, being uh, worship is not where you want to be. And you probably guess we're talking today about the importance of being together and looking at it a little bit differently, looking at it in, a, in a, such a way that shows us, in essence, what we're giving up by not being together. And now I know this is a, a touchy subject for some, and I understand if you have your complaints, you can go ahead and send those complaints to uh, curtis1960 at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, we will get back to you as soon as we can. I, I promise. I understand complaints. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and send them, them there, and I will, I will get back to you on that. You know, church, something I've been thinking about lately is, is the fact that if we could be successful as disciples alone, then we have no need for the church. If you and I were going to be good at this thing called being a Christian, and if we were going to be able to be good at that alone, by ourselves, completely uh, trying to live out our faith to God by ourselves, completely isolated from each other, then the church really has no purpose. You know, God's a lot smarter than me. And I, by a lot smarter than me, I mean a lot, lot, lot smarter than me. I mean uh, otherworldly smarter than me. And I think it's really cool that the church has always been the intention of God from the very beginning of time. That God has always meant for there to be a time when His believers, His followers, the disciples of Jesus could be together, encouraging each other, building each other up. And I'm going to make a confession to you. If it weren't for these assemblies, I would fail miserably in my faith. I would fail miserably in my faith. I absolutely could not make it if it wasn't for you guys and for other friends and family that I have that attends the Lord's Church and other places, there's a reason that church camp is a huge part of my life. And that is because I feel like for that two weeks out of the year, or the last few years it's been three weeks, for those two or three weeks out of the year, every single year, I get to be around my family, my church family, my church friends, all day, every day, for a couple of weeks. I'm away from the world. I'm away from all that the world throws at me. And I get to be with people that I know love me and people with whom I have all things in common with. And it's easy to be fired up about your faith when you leave a place like church camp or when you leave a retreat and people say it like it's a bad thing. Well, they're just on that camp high. Man, I've often thought, man, if only I could go home and make sure that church camp or that youth retreat high never left. And in essence, the only difference between church camp and, and here is here I'm not surrounded by brethren all the time. That's really, in essence, the only difference. It's not, like, uh, it's not like I'm not studying the Bible when I'm here as much as I am there. It's not that uh, I'm not thinking about God as much here as I am there. The only real difference for me is I'm away from my brothers and my sisters sometimes. And that makes all the difference in the world. If we could succeed by ourselves, there would be absolutely no need for the church. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one, that is Jesus, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. Now you're probably thinking, how does this tie in with our message? Brethren, there is a message in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 that I do not want you to miss, okay? And the message is this. When it says, the one who walks among his seven golden lampstands, the message is clear. And the message is that Jesus is with his church. Jesus is with his church. When you and I come together, Jesus is with us, guiding us, motivating us, encouraging us, 
Jesus is with his church. And brethren, I don't know about you, but if Jesus is with the church, then where the church is where I want to be, amen? If that's where Jesus is, then that's where I want to be. Because I want to feel as close to Him as I could possibly feel. And I believe that right here together is the place where I feel closer to my God than anywhere else. This is as good as it gets. This is as close to heaven as any of us are ever going to see before we get there. This is an amazing, amazing opportunity to be together. You know, I read books and I hear stories and I read articles sometimes about the church in other places in the world. And I was reading a book here not too long ago called Radical. And the book opens up with this guy, and he's a denominational guy. It opens up with him uh, talking about being a part of the underground church in Asia. And he went over there on a mission trip. And he's sitting in a, in a dark room with a bunch of the, uh, the fellow disciples there over in Asia. And they're having to kind of keep their voices down, and they're, they're having to meet in secret and as they're going around this circle and different people are speaking, they were saying things like, man, if I get caught again, they'll probably kill me. Somebody else would say, they already took my wife and my children. Another would say, they already took my car. They took my home. They, they, they took me out of my house. They put me in prison for X amount of time. They were saying things like that. And brethren, it means something to me that I get to be here today without fear of that persecution. It's amazing to me that we get to sit here in this pew week after week in our heated and or air conditioned building in those padded pews and we get to listen to the almighty Word of God every single week together. And we take it for granted sometimes, I say, that I would think that we absolutely um, take it for granted. So if Jesus is with his church, then the church is where I want to be. And there are some opportunities that we miss, brethren, when we choose to not be here together. And I want you to know that as I'm standing up here, what I'm not doing, what I'm not doing is criticizing those who do not come, because that is not what this message is all about. This message is not about me criticizing you for not being here. This is not me in any way, shape, or form looking at this in, in that negative light, what I simply want to do is help you understand how good you have it to sit there in that pew and to be able to encounter Jesus on a weekly basis. I'm not here to criticize. I'm here to encourage. There are opportunities that we have when we're together. And one of them is an opportunity for revival. Now, when you look at the word revival, you may be thinking, what do you mean by revival? I'll, I'll tell you what revival is. In essence, revival is bringing back to life that which was dead, right? It's bringing back to life that which is dead. Brethren, I have a question for you. How many times have you walked through that door defeated and you left encouraged? How many times have you walked through that door and you were way down here, and you experienced God, and you left up here for Him. How many times have you walked through those doors, and the world was getting to you, and you left more excited about living for Him than you had been in so long before? How many times have you walked through the door discouraged, feeling hopeless, maybe helpless, and you left hopeful, and you left excited? How many times have you walked through those doors empty, and you've left full. The church is a place that does some amazing things to a person. It changes everything about your life. Being together, singing songs to God, praying together, hearing the message of God. And I don't know about you, but I believe that this Bible, this Word of God is just as practical today as it was 2,000 years ago. I believe that God's Word will never be outdated. I believe that it will never run out. I believe that it will always be able to, to mold and to shape. I believe that it's just as powerful today as it has ever been. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> as we think about this opportunity for revival. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. It says, So then, those who had received His Word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, brother, I want to stop right there. 
And I want to say a couple of things. If you read Acts chapter 2, please don't stop at verse 38. Please don't stop at verse 38. We do that so often, don't we? If you go to Acts chapter 2 sometime and you're studying that, please, please, please do not stop at verse 38 because the story doesn't end there, right? There's some really cool teaching later in Acts chapter 2, and one of them is right here in verse 42. I want you to notice some things they were devoted to. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now that's important, right? They're they're dedicated to studying the Word together, and that is important. But brethren, there is more. Oh my goodness, there is more to verse 42 than Bible study. And I want you to, to take notice of what they are. Not only to the apostles' teaching, but they're also dedicated to, here's the word, fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Brethren, do you wish you could have gotten to experience this Acts chapter 2 church in its glory? You ever thought about that? You ever wish that you could have experienced growth like this? That you could have experienced being together every single day? That you could have experienced growth like you've never imagined? Well, brethren, here's something I want to mention. My expectations, my expectations are the same for us as it was for them. And oftentimes, the only reason that we don't experience growth and that we don't experience amazing things happening is because we have our doubts. And because we have low expectations for what God can do. Brethren, has your God not shown you what He is capable of? Steph Curry right? Steph Curry has changed the game of basketball forever. The guy is a a freak. He is a stud. Let me tell you something about Steph Curry. I can remember several years ago watching Steph Curry, and he'd take a step in front of the half-court line and pull it, and he'd make it. And the first few times he did that, I'm sitting there thinking, dude, this is the luckiest dude that's ever played in the NBA, right? I'm like, this is the luckiest guy I've ever seen in the NBA. But let me tell you what happened. He did it again, and then he did it again, And then he did it again. And soon enough, it got to the point he was doing it frequently, multiple times a game. And I came to a conclusion, brethren. And my conclusion was this. This guy's not lucky. This guy's just really good, right? It took him doing it over and over again to prove a point in my mind that that is what he was capable of. God has shown you over and over and over again what he is capable of. He has shown you in the way that He has revived you in those moments of weakness. He has shown you that in bringing together your family at times when they weren't so together. He has shown you that in helping you fight and beat that addiction that you were struggling with or that sin, that temptation, that anxiety, that worry. God has shown you what He is capable of. Now the question becomes, why do we sit back and look at that and still question whether or not God can do something? God has shown us over and over and over again what He is capable of. And I believe with all of my heart that God can take the Shakota Church of Christ to a level we have never seen it before. And the reason I believe that is not because I'm some great, powerful speaker. I don't believe that in the slightest. But I do believe that God works through people who want to be used by Him. And I believe that God can provide growth. And I believe that God can provide revival with you and I. And as I look in Acts chapter 2 and I see this church and I see what they were devoted to and I see what they were doing. They were together. They were encouraging. They were building. And God was providing. The same can happen for you and I. And I hope that you don't doubt it for even a second. I hope that you don't question God's ability to bring about revival. So when we make the decision not to be together, what we're really doing is missing out on an opportunity to be revived because the world tears you down and when you come together and you get away from that, it brings you closer to God. I want to ask you one more time because I don't think you heard me the first time. How many times? And I want you to think about this. I mean, seriously, I want you to think about it in your mind. 
How many times have you walked through the doors of this church building defeated and left encouraged? It's happened to all of us. It's happened to me. I know what's happened to you. You've seen it. You've heard it. You've felt it. Trust it. And trust that that is nothing short of the goodness and the wisdom of God creating this beautiful thing called the church. So we're missing out on an opportunity for revival, for encouragement. We're also missing out on an opportunity to revive other people. Now, I'll tell you something else. I have people in my life, and I won't mention names specifically, but I have people in my life that we, we'll get together sometimes, and, and we'll, maybe we'll eat dinner together, we'll drink coffee together, we'll just kind of shoot the bull together. And, and uh, I can tell you, I, I wake up that morning, and I'm like, oh, I have to drive to this place and do that thing, and I'm not excited about it. But then I get with this brother or this sister, and it's like all of those negative thoughts go away. And the reason is because that brother or that sister encourages me in such a way that I'm always, always encouraged when I leave them. You have that brother or sister, don't you? That person here that every time you talk to them, they get you excited about your faith. Every time you talk to them, you feel encouraged. They encourage you. They help you become closer to Jesus. We're missing out not only on an opportunity for ourselves, but we don't want to think selfishly, church. We're also missing out on an opportunity to revive someone else. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 it says, and let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds. Not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, <clears throat> but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Brethren, please don't look at this passage that we're so familiar with and don't come away with this idea, well, God says I can't forsake the assembly, so I guess I better get my butt to church. Please don't take that message from Hebrews chapter 10, because that's not the message at all, okay? That's not the message of Hebrews chapter 10. The message of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, is you need to be there because there are people that need you. There are people that need you. They need your encouragement. They need your excitement. They need your passion. They need your wisdom. That's the message, brethren. The message is not, well, God says I better go, so I guess I better go ahead and get my butt to church. No, the message is there's someone there that needs you. There's someone there that could use you. If you don't think that there are people in this congregation right now that are hurting, you're wrong. If you don't think that there are people in this congregation right now that are struggling with something, that are grieving over people that they love, that they've lost, that are struggling with some type of temptation that you yourself have already dealt with and, and conquered, you're wrong. There are people right here that need you so badly. I need you. The message is not, well, God says I better go. God says to go, so I go. Although that would be good enough reason, <clears throat> but the message is, Someone needs you, and you have an obligation. I think it's interesting that if you read on in Hebrews chapter 10, the very next verse, the word for appears. That three-letter word is everything, by the way. When you see that, that three-letter word for in the Bible, it is a word that means, let me tell you why. Okay, You see it occur all throughout the Bible. When you see it in the New Testament, the word for, what it means, it means let me tell you why. So when the author says in verses 24 and 25, get together, encourage each other, then you see that word for, it means let me tell you why you should get together. And it says, for if we go on sinning willfully, you know that passage, right? After receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains atonement for our sins. So this is the message. I, don't miss this now. Don't miss this. The message is when you're together and you're encouraging and you're building, that's how you combat Satan. That's how you make sure that no one leaves this building and goes and, and willfully sins during the week. That's the message. Let me tell you why you should be together. Because brethren, when we are together, this is how we combat Satan. This is how we beat him. And I don't know about you, but I am beyond tired of him having wins in my life. I'm over it. I'm tired of it. When you and I get together, God wins and Satan loses. What other motivation do we need? When we're together on a Sunday morning, God's day, the Lord's day, and we're worshiping and encouraging, God wins and Satan loses. And that excites me. I'm trying not to get all stirred up in here today, but y'all's going to have to, 
Y'all going to have to calm me down here. Uh, God wins and Satan loses. And that is motivation enough for me to wake up excited that I get to be with the brethren on a Sunday morning. We miss out on an opportunity to revive ourselves, to be revived, but we also miss out on an amazing opportunity to revive someone else that could use us. We're also missing out on an opportunity to praise. An opportunity to praise. When I think about all that my God has done for me, I can't help but want to say thank you. In Psalm 106 and verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy is everlasting. Psalm 100 verses 4 and 5 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courtyards with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. Isn't that the truth, brethren? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His faithfulness is to all generations. Psalm 95 verses 1-3 through says, Come, let's sing for joy to the Lord. Let's shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before His presence with a song of thanksgiving. Let's shout joyfully to Him in songs with instruments. Now, that's a conversation for another day, but you see the principle still applies. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Psalm 35 and verse 18, I will give you thanks in the great congregation and I will praise you among a mighty people. Brethren, if you're ever having a bad day, go read the Psalms. Man, go read the Psalms. They're encouraging. That's kind of my go-to when I'm having one of those down days. I love reading the Psalms and seeing the psalmist's attitude toward praising and worshiping God. And unfortunately, when we're together for worship, there's an aspect of worship that we leave out sometimes. And I'm guilty of it, just like you are. And the aspect of worship we tend to leave out is, is the aspect of praise is the aspect of God, I'm telling you how good you are. God, I'm telling you how great you are. And I'm telling you how much I love you. And I'm telling you how much you mean to me. When we're singing songs, and you probably noticed some of these psalms, by the way. My translation is, is, it changes it around, but you probably recognize some of these psalms. I use them on purpose. Because a lot of these psalms come from songs that you and I sing when we're together. And the question is, are you thinking about what you're singing? And does it really mean something to you? When you sing, for the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods, and His hands are the depths of the earth. And the mountain peaks belong to Him, and the sea is His. He made it, and His hands form the dry land. When you say, and give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, His love endures forever. Does that mean something to you? Do you mean what you're singing? When we come together, there is an aspect of worship that is an opportunity to praise God and tell Him how good He is. I could go on for days and days and days about what God has done for me. We sing this song, Count Your Blessings. Brother, I think you would be overwhelmed if you ever sat down and began to write out all the things that God has blessed you with. It would overwhelm you. I encourage you to do that sometime, by the way. Just sit down, take out a piece of paper, and think, okay, these are some things that my God has done for me. And start writing them out. And right about the time you're running out of paper, you'll realize exactly what I'm saying to you right now. That God has blessed you in so many ways. So many ways. It is unbelievable. And one way that He has blessed you is by giving you a family here in Shakota to be a part of and to explain and proclaim God's goodness. So we miss out on an opportunity to praise and to tell God how much we love Him. I mean singing. I'm telling you, I'm a music person. You probably noticed that by now. I'm a music person. I love playing musical instruments. I love all of that stuff. Singing together does something for me that really nothing else can. It, it, it just brings me to a point that I just can't even explain my excitement. There are times at church camp, if you're not careful, they let me lead songs some days during our singing sessions, and rather than 30 minutes, it's like an hour and 30 minutes because I can't make myself stop. You know what I'm talking about. I can't make myself stop because I absolutely love it. And I think one of the reasons I love singing so much is singing is one of your only opportunities. It's one of your greatest opportunities. It's, it's direct communication between you and God. The words that you're singing, as you're singing them to God, that is you telling God, again, how good He is and how much He means to you. It's a direct line of praise between you and Him. And it's an amazing thing, and I hope you don't take it 
for granted. When I think about all my God has done for me, it makes me want to praise His name. Amen, church? An opportunity to praise. And lastly, when we make the decision not to be together, we miss out on an opportunity to experience unconditional love. To our visitors this morning, amen. We're so glad that you're here. Praise God that you're here. And I want you to know something you've probably already noticed, and that is that you're in the right place. You have found a group of people that will love you and share things with you. And I don't mean food. They don't share their food, but they'll share with you other things. Um, no, they might would do that. You've got to pick them on the right day. But you're in a place with people that love you and care about you and are so glad that you are here. We are so glad that you're here. And brethren, when we're together, when I'm with you, I'm not going to speak for you anymore. When I am with you, I get to see your love. When I was in Louisiana, I got to see your love, your calls, your text messages, and it just made my heart swell with encouragement and excitement because it meant so much to me. I get to see your love in the way you treat each other. So many times you don't realize that one of my favorite things about every now and again getting to sit back in the sound booth is I get to just sit there and watch all of you. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I get to sit there and I get to watch you hugging each other. I get to sit there and watch and, and listen in on some of the conversations you're having with each other. I get to see the encouragement even more so standing there with nothing else to do but watch your love for each other. And it starts there. But you know the love that we experience when we're here together, it goes beyond even the love of you and I to each other. We experience the love that all of us have for God. That's an amazing thing. But it goes beyond that. It doesn't stop there. Every time we're together, you get to experience firsthand a love that the world has never seen before. When we take of this supper, and we're going to do that here in a little bit, when we take of the Lord's Supper and we get to consider all that Jesus has done for us, we remember a love that the world has never seen before that and it will never see again. The greatest example of love ever shown throughout history is the love that Jesus had on the cross. The love that He showed you and I in taking our place by becoming sin, this is a powerful thought to me. He who was without sin became sin so that I could be sinless. He who was without sin, I'm going to say that again because I think some of you missed it. He who was without sin became sin so that I could be sinless. And you get to experience that. You get to remember that. You get to sing about it. We get to pray about it. We get to talk about it. All that good stuff every single time that we're together. Well, brethren, I have something else I want to mention while we're talking about this unconditional love. Unfortunately, when we're together, <clears throat> perhaps every single week, we have people right here that are still questioning whether or not that love was enough for them. We still have people every single week who come here and they question whether the cross was enough. And you say, well, I don't really question the cross. Well, brethren, questioning the cross looks like this. I don't know if I've done enough to go to heaven or not. I don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if I've worked hard enough. I, 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 I don't know if I've overcome sin enough. I don't know if I'm enough, if I'm good enough. And we ask those questions. <coughs> But brethren, I want to make a point to you that you can understand. Some of you can't see this, and that's okay. What we've done without realizing it is we have sent a message that says our sin is too big and our God is too small. When we make statements like, I don't know if I'm good enough, or I don't know if I've done enough, or I don't know if I get to go to heaven, I don't know... I've obeyed the gospel. I've been immersed into Christ Jesus, but I don't know. What you've done without realizing it is create for yourself a God who is too small and a sin that is too big. And whenever you take your sin and its completeness, when you create a God that is small and you try to find that sin hidden in God, it doesn't work because your God is too small. 
no matter how many times I try to cram this box in that other box, it ain't going to get in there. Now, I could try to fold it up and stick it in there, but it's not going to work very well. Your God is too small, and your sin is too big. But brethren, the message that I think is so cool is the message that our God is bigger than our sin. Now, here's what is cool. Not only what we just talked about, not only can we take our, our sin and our worries, our anxieties, we can, we can pick it up, we can grab our sin, and we, and we get to place it on God. And that's an amazing thing. We get to take it, and we get to place it in God. But when we get to a place of faith and confidence in God, here's what happens. Not only do we take aspects of our life and hand it over to God, we take our life we take our sin, we take everything else, and we become hidden with Christ. And it's gone, and you see it no more. And the message is this, brethren. We get together every single week to celebrate the fact that our sin is no more. We get to celebrate every single week the fact that our God has taken our sin and He has said, place it on me. Place it in me. When we get to that point of faith, what we will experience and what we will find is that we are completely hidden in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Don't forget this passage. I want you to remember it forever. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what? I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to say this with me on the count of three. We're going to read it together. Here we go. One, two, three. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. One more time. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Church, don't ever, ever, ever forget it. There is now no condemnation. It has become hidden in Christ, in God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if that's not enough, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Brethren, do you know it? Are you confident? Are you absolutely certain that when this life is over for you that you're going to be with God? I hope that you have that conviction. I hope that you have that confidence. And I want you to come back tonight. I want you to come back Wednesday night. I want you to come back next week. And I want to celebrate together the fact that we serve a risen Savior and a God who has taken our sin away. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Maybe you're sitting there today and you don't know whether or not you have eternal life. Maybe you're sitting there and you're questioning and you're doubting. We want to help you with that. The worst thing that can happen is for you to hear this message Walk out that door and still have uncertainty. We want you to leave knowing that you're saved. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we want to help you take care of that. That is available. That is absolutely available. Do not leave with uncertainty. If you've never been baptized into Christ Jesus, we can take care of that. I can assure you, we can get you taken care of. Brethren, and those who aren't brethren yet, we want you to know for certain that you are saved. And as we offer this song of invitation, I want you to think about how confident you are in your salvation. Brethren, if you're in need of anything at all, please come as we stand and as we sing.